Few people realize that the old family Bible gathering dust in the bookshelf has a fascinating history of its own. Even if you open the scriptures on a regular basis, the story of how this collection of holy writings got into the hands of the people may be one you've heard little about. Tonight, we take a look at that story, of how the Bible came to be translated into English by men who risked their lives to do it. The Bible in the people's language. That's tonight on The Pressure Point. Good evening, and welcome to Pressure Point. I'm your host, Barbara Anderson, for this show. And uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about anniversary, a special anniversary. It seems that 1985, 1986 is the year of the anniversary. We've had uh, the centennial of, of the Thomas Crosby, uh, Pressure Point's 10th anniversary, of course, Vancouver City's own uh, special anniversary in uh, 1986, and also 1985, which we've just had, has had a, a special anniversary, the 450th anniversary of the Bible in the People's Language. And to celebrate that, there's a special exposition going on at the Vancouver School of Theology, and we have with us tonight our special guest, Gerald Hobbs, Professor of Church History Thanks. at the Vancouver School of Theology, to talk about that with us. Welcome, Gerald, to the program. Thank you, Barbara. First of all, let's talk about the Bible in the people's language. What do you mean by the people's language? What, what are we referring to? A good question, Barbara. Of course, uh, the scriptures for the Hebrew people uh, and for the uh, people in the time of Jesus were in the people's language. They were in, in Hebrew and in Greek, which was an ordinary common language. But as often happens in religion, what started out as a people's language becomes more and more a sacred language, uh, and in fact fewer and fewer people could understand Hebrew and Greek. So you have the development of scriptures in a sacred language, and along with that, uh, a sacred group of people, uh, the clergy, who read them and interpret them to the people. So when we talk about the Bible in the people's language, we're talking about putting the Bible back into the language that the people use in their ordinary life. And this particular uh, centennial, or anniversary, we should say, 450 years is referring to English? Yes, specifically to the first printed English Bible, that's right. Now, we're, we're talking about 1535, around that time. That's the time that King Henry VIII was ruling England. I that's right. looked in my history books. Good. And uh, what impact did that have on uh, this event, the fact that the Bible was now translated into English? Well. In England, in fact, for about a hundred or more years prior to the time of Henry VIII, uh, it had been not possible to have the Bible in the English language except with the permission of a bishop. And that situation continued to be the case on into the early years of King Henry VIII. But of course, as we know, Henry had all kinds of marital difficulties. <laughs> uh, actually, what we should say is his wives had all kinds of difficulties uh, with Henry. But uh, the upshot of his, uh, of his famous uh, divorce, which he got by uh, breaking with uh, the Pope and declaring the Church of England independent at the beginning of the 1530s, was that a door was opened in England for uh, the printing of an English Bible uh, for the first time. Now, we heard a little bit about Henry and his uh, marital problems, but what was the religious and political climate of the time? Did, what effect did that have on, on the translation? Uh, a great deal. In fact, we're talking about the uh, period that we call the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of, of the modern era, and there were a lot of things taking place that, that played out in the story of, of the making of the uh, English Bible. Uh, socially, for example, more people were living in cities, and uh, these people uh, got sufficient education for their children, if not for themselves, so that there was a, a significant portion of the common people who could read. It's not right. That's uh, uh, something we don't really think no, about. No, we don't. Uh, yeah, that's true. But generally speaking, uh, popular education only is really beginning in this period. Hmm. So that means there's a reading public significantly for the first time in, in centuries. Um, technology played a part. Uh, this is the period when Gutenberg perfected, uh, we, we always say the printing press. In fact, what he perfected was the use of movable type that made hmm. it possible to print books instead of copying them out by hand. And that meant uh, that within 50 to 75 years, uh, really a, a, a technological revolution, uh, for the first time, uh, literature was relatively accessible. Books still cost a lot more than they cost us today. Uh, but people were willing to pay for it, and certainly they cost much less than manuscripts. 
Uh, in the church, it was a time when for a couple of centuries there had been a tremendous concern for reform, a feeling that, that the life of the church was out of hand, and this is the period we call the Reformation, so that uh, people like uh, Erasmus and Luther are calling for a reform of the church, a return to the simplicity of the early centuries, and, and a return to a biblical faith, a faith that is not so much um, involving uh, teachings that have grown up over the years and have uh, been built up around the institution, but a return to what they understood as a simpler biblical faith. And all of that, of course, is, is part of the story of why they were interested in translating uh, the Bible into the common language. You mentioned Luther and Erasmus. Those are uh, reformational giants in, on the uh, European continent. Was there any one person who was instrumental in translating the Bible into English at the time that we're talking about here? Yes, there are, there are maybe two people that, that uh, we could mention tonight. Uh, one is William Tyndall. Uh, Tyndall is, is the first and in many respects the most uh, outstanding figure. He, uh, in the early years of Henry VIII's reign, when, when uh, England was hostile to Bible translation, uh, he tried to get a bishop to uh, support a project for translating the New Testament, and when the bishop wouldn't, he went to the continent and there worked uh, as best he could, uh, sometimes in hiding, sometimes living in the communities of English merchants on the continent, until he had prepared a translation of the New Testament. And that actually came out in, in 1525-26. There's quite an amusing story, actually, in connection with that. The bishops back in England had got wind that this uh, English translation of the New Testament was being printed in uh, Belgium, or what's now Belgium. And they decided that the best thing to do so that it wouldn't reach the English public was to send uh, a, uh, an, an agent over disguised as, as someone interested in the Bible and have him <laughs> buy the entire lot, uh, which they did. So Tyndall didn't have any more New Testaments, and the chap burned them all. But of course, Tyndall made enough profit on the whole enterprise that he was able to just go out and print twice as many, so that there are no copies left of the first edition, but he was able to print lots of copies on the second edition, so, so it backfired. <laughs> <laughs> they were undermined on that, but That's it's, right. it's intriguing that there was so much espionage going on around that whole project of translating the Bible, and we, we think of it as, here it is sitting here in today uh, yes. on our set, it's in homes, and yet the, it had to be done under covert uh, methods. Oh, it really did. Uh, I mean, England exercised severe censure, there was a, a law against doing this, and Tyndall in the end, uh, in 1536, was burned at the stake Whoa. for his work. The other person that, uh, that we should mention, uh, who is directly connected with the anniversary, is uh, Miles Coverdale. Uh, he managed to die in his bed as a very old man, so not everybody <laughs> got burned at the stake in the 16th Isn't it century. For him? No, that's right. But he is the person who took Tyndall's New Testament and carried on the work in the Old Testament and uh, produced in 1534-35 the first complete translation of the Bible uh, to be printed. It actually wasn't even printed in England. At that point, hmm. there still wasn't permission. It was printed somewhere on the European continent, probably again in, in uh, well, in Germany or in Belgium, and uh, then brought by bail loads to, to England, and by this time uh, it, they allowed it to be sold. Oh, That's so right. it wasn't just smuggled in, now it was brought no, in? No, Tyndall's New Testament was smuggled in. By the mm -hmm. time Coverdale's was done, they were able to get it in without too much difficulty, and then a year or so later they started printing them uh, in large numbers in England. Now, with all this kind of having to smuggle the Bible in, um, what kind of effect did having the Bible now in English, what kind of effect did that have on uh, the church and society in England? Well, you know, actually, as, as strange as it sounds for us, as you say, the Bible is so common to us, mm -hmm. uh, it had a revolutionary effect both in society and in the church. Um, revolutionary because if you have a sacred language and a clergy who can handle it, uh, you you contribute to the whole uh, pyramid of society in which there are some people at the top who control and there are the people at the bottom who are controlled. The ones who give the orders, the top, the ones who obey at the bottom. The ones with the knowledge or the mis who Absolutely. know the mystery. Absolutely, that's right. And uh, it's clear that the leaders of society realized too that to put the Bible into the language of the people was to give that power of knowledge uh, to the people and that that could have revolutionary consequences. It did, in fact. Uh, the result of Luther's uh, translation of the New Testament into German 
about 10 years earlier, uh, was uh, a real contribution to the uh, rebellion of the peasants throughout Germany in 1524-25. And they couched their demands in that rebellion in terms of the claims of the gospel and their right to be free people uh, and, and to live as free people, uh, free Christians, the same as the people who were their masters. So that kind of, of, of uh, revolutionary potential was there in society. Uh, it continues to be there uh, in society today where the Bible is read and used and people, and people read of God's will for human life. Uh, a blow is struck. Uh, courage is given to them to rise up against all forms of injustice. I mean, I think, for example, of uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu in mm -hmm. South Africa, who's been so much in the news. And I remember seeing a few years ago a film clip in which he was preaching to a largely white crowd, and he had the Bible in his hands. And he was saying, the Bible is a, a revolutionary document. He said, maybe you shouldn't have given it to us, because now we are taking it seriously. Exactly. <laughs> right, absolutely. They'd also, of course, had revolutionary consequences in the church. Uh, when people read the Bible for themselves, when people heard Luther's teachings that every Christian is baptized, every Christian should read the Bible, every Christian must have faith for themselves, uh, that overturned all kind of religious hierarchies as well uh, and brought about many, many changes in the way in which people worshipped uh, in the organization of church life and so on. Now, why did it take so long? I mean, in a way, and since you've, you've sort of talked about that, because you've got power structures based on having some people know and, and most of the people not know what, what's in the Bible. And, but w why did it take 1,200 years, say, since the time of Constantine, for example, to have uh, the Bible translated into the language of the people in England? Was well, it that kind of a struggle? Well, it's a, actually, it's a, it's a complicated story because... Uh, Many centuries earlier, uh, the process of translating the Bible had already begun. Uh, the Bible started out in Hebrew and Greek, of course, and, and as we said at the beginning, when these were languages that were no longer understood by the common people, uh, in the early centuries there were translations of the Bible into Latin. Mm. Later, the Latin became a sacred language too, but when it was first made, it was a translation for the common people. Uh, in the Christian Middle Ages too, there were sometimes uh, translations made uh, before the time of printing, they had to be copied out in manuscripts, of course. Uh, John Wycliffe in England in the 14th century, although he didn't do it himself, his followers did. Um, there were translations in France, in Germany, and so on. But in the state of the church and that hierarchy I was talking about uh, earlier, uh, in the, especially in the later Middle Ages, uh, more and more church leaders and society's leaders came to believe that putting the Bible into the people's uh, language, into their hands, making it accessible to them, was dangerous for the structures of order in society. And that's fr frankly why it really took so long. That and the fact, of course, that most people didn't read. Mm. So that although there were some translations available, if people didn't read, it didn't make a great it, deal of there difference. There was no point. That's right. Now, okay, when uh, the, this 1535 edition came out, was it the only edition at the time? You mentioned Tyndale and, and, and Coverdale. Uh, were there other uh, unofficial editions that were coming out at the time? Yes, in fact, Coverdale's, that were just, of which we're just celebrating the anniversary, was an unofficial edition in that sense. The very first official edition only came out, uh, I think it was three years later. Uh, there were a number of editions. Uh, Coverdale, for example, was not a very good scholar. He mostly depended on the work of Luther and others in, in mm. Europe and translated into the English, not from Hebrew and Greek, but from German and <laughs> Latin. A and later on, those who were better scholars uh, improved and polished and the whole process of developing the English Bible till it, till it came finally about 70 years later in the time of King James to the, to the famous authorized or King James version that, that most people think of when they think of the Bible. Uh, that was a long growing process. There were many editions. There were also, and, and I think this is worth noting, there were also many different sizes of Bibles. Mm. Uh, rich people would buy a large Bible like this, a folio we would call it, and that might cost the equivalent of a month's wages mm. or more for perhaps half a year's wages for, for a poor worker. But uh, there were also little Bibles, some of them so small that they could just fit into a pocket. And that's part of the revolution, was printing the Bible in 
tiny print. I mean, you, you really did have to get it up close to the candle to be able to read it. But uh, making it accessible to people in cheap editions. The first pocketbook or Absolutely. paperback the, uh, That's right. editions. There are, there are pocketbook editions that are about this size. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. And the other ones, of course, being like maybe they are today if they're that big uh, coffee table kind of books. <laughs> yes, coffee table books and for use in the churches, of course. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, what about some of the interesting editions that, that may have had some kind of a typographical errors? Or I, I think of uh, one that comes to mind called the Breaches uh, Bible and, and other ones. That, are there any interesting anecdotes that you could relate to us? Yes, of course, there were all kinds of problems, both in translation, sometimes translators unwittingly fell into, into uh, humorous mistakes, and sometimes there were typographical errors. The Breaches Bible you mentioned is, is a good case in point. In, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, the story of Adam and Eve where they partake of the forbidden fruit and then discover they're naked. Uh, our traditional Bibles say they took fig leaves and sewed for themselves aprons. But uh, one aprons. of the Bible <laughs> translations said they made for themselves breeches and so that Bible came to be called the Breeches Bible. I guess today we'd probably say they made loincloths, but anyway. <laughs> or we might, if we want to be up to date, maybe they made some blue jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Anyway, they called it the Breeches Bible. Uh, another, uh, another one uh, that uh, is worth remembering is the so-called Bug Bible. Uh, that's because in, in Psalm 91, verse 6, uh, our traditional translations say something like, uh, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Uh, one of the Bibles, uh, one of the very first ones, translated that psalm, you shall not be afraid of the night bugs. <laughs> night bugs. Yes. <laughs> Someone moths, had a great fear uh, of night bugs. <laughs> that's right, uh, bed bugs, uh, whatever. But actually it wasn't bugs at all. It was spelled B-U-G-G-E-S, uh, but there were no rules for spelling in the 16th century in any language, and what it in fact meant was boogies. As in boogeyman. As in boogeyman, boogeyman. that's oh. right. You shall not be afraid of the night boogies, and that came from an <laughs> old Jewish legend that what was really being talked about there were the evil spirits that walked around in the darkness. And this psalm oh. was a promise that, that the evil spirits that roam the world in darkness would not be able to affect you. Uh, the one other one I'll mention quickly in passing is called the Wicked Bible. In 1631, there was a uh, printing of the King James Bible which came out where the word not was left out of one of the Ten Commandments so that it said, Thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> that's a Bible that I guess a lot of people would like to get it. <laughs> yes, that's right. There are not many copies around, but it seems to have had a lot of influence. Did, did they uh, sort of uh, call them back? Have a they, recall? Call, they called them all back, and they're supposed to have fined the printers a thousand pounds. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we talked about some of the, uh, the effect that this had uh, on, on England, and, and we've talked about uh, the other countries having translations before England, Germany, and so on. Mm -hmm. What about other faiths? Have they been involved in, in translating the Bible at all, or have they had any benefit from, from uh, translating the Bible? Well, in fact, the, the translation of the Bible in the 16th century really was an ecumenical event. I mean, we think of it as a Protestant Bible and as Protestant religion, but in fact, uh, Christians could not have translated the Old Testament from Hebrew without the help of Jews, uh, yes. not only in Jewish books, uh, but also Jews to help teach them how to read the Hebrew language. Uh, when it came to the New Testament, uh, the help of uh, Greek Orthodox scholars who could teach them how to read Greek. These, these things were knowledges that had been and skills that had been forgotten in the West. So that both Jews and Eastern Orthodox scholars uh, helped bring about these vernacular Bibles. Uh, the other reason that I, would, that I would cite for saying that the Bible in the people's language is an ecumenical event is that although in the 16th century uh, we really see the, the church being split apart into Catholic and, and Protestant, and the Protestants have the Bible and the Catholics have the church, uh, mm -hmm. in fact in our day, especially in the last 25 or 30 years, uh, we've seen a tremendous moving both in Protestant and Catholic circles towards a Bible rootedness. Uh, mm -hmm. For, for all of our faith. And there's a coming together in, in Bible study and in concern about our biblical faith uh, that means that I think we're really celebrating an ecumenical event. Certainly some of the uh, Latin American countries uh, have appropriated the Bible in, in uh, some of their communities. That's they? right. The, the base Christian communities of Central and South America have made the Bible study by the, uh, by the poor people uh, 
a center of their of their Christian life, and again, often with with uh, radical consequences for their concern to change the world in which they're living. It really has an impact, doesn't it? It does. We should go, get on a little bit to talk about the exposition itself, um, if we can. What are some of the artifacts that you will have on display at the school? Well, we have a Bible from 1541, which is just, uh, what is that, five years short or six years short of 450 years? One of the very, very first. And is it p part of the school's own property, or did you have to send away for that to some no, museum? Uh, uh, it actually belongs to uh, the rare book room of the VST Library. We've got some marvelous treasures there, and one of the reasons for the exhibition is to be able to let the public see those. I imagine that itself might be a story on its own to do a whole program on how you came to acquire that uh, Bible. Yes, though I'm not sure how we did, oh. to tell you the truth. Uh, but that. it's badly, badly worn. I mm. suspect it's one of those Bibles that got put away in a, in a cupboard in a time when, uh, when they were persecuted for having them and, and got wet and maybe oh, the, the mice ate at it and so on. Some of the early pages are missing and so on. But it's really quite exciting. We also uh, will have on display uh, the New Testament, the Greek New Testament of Erasmus, which was so revolutionary because it put the Greek text of the New Testament into the hands of scholars who could then in turn translate it into the people's language. We'll have uh, a couple of Hebrew Bibles, again, which brought the Hebrew scriptures to the scholars who could translate it for the common people. Uh, we'll also be having in the exhibition some uh, some items that look at the result of this revolution uh, in the lives of Christian people down through the years. Uh, some very interesting children's Bibles, for example, mm. illustrated, uh, illustrated family Bibles that all of us uh, have some recollection of in terms of the great big giant Bible right. sitting on the coffee with table the, and so on. With the storybook pictures. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, what kind of work do you do in preparing for an exposition like this? Do you have to do a lot of research or do you have students doing research as well on it? Yes, well it does of course require a certain amount of, of background reading and preparation. I like to do this kind of thing with students and I have in fact a team of students and uh, a couple of faculty members who are working with me on it and that makes it quite enjoyable. Such a huge project would really need to be collaborative, wouldn't it? And I imagine for both students and faculty it would be a really fascinating way to learn about the subject by digging through antiques and artifacts. Now, you, this isn't the first exposition you've done. You've also uh, done one on Methodism, which was last year? Yes, about 14, 15 months ago, yes. Now, is this going to be a kind of a, an annual event to do these kind of expositions? I mean, they're, they're great ideas, I think. Who, who is listening? <laughs> uh, I enjoy doing it. I've been part of doing it uh, in Europe when I was a member ah. of uh, university faculty there, and uh, I think it's a good educational tool. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we do another one again. That would be great. But <laughs> not think. next week or next month. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not even next year. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Takes a long time. Well, in some ways, 450 years is, is a long time. And we talked about, you know, short times of our own anniversary, centennials that we celebrate here are just 100 years. Yeah. And in other ways, it's, it's uh, from a historical perspective, it's a really um, not a very long time at all. Uh, it's a very short time. What, uh, what do you think some of the major consequences uh, of the Bible in, in, uh, into the translation of, of the peop language of the people has been um, in, say, in, in politics, in history, in theology? Well, it's putting the Bible into the people's language has certainly been part of the whole flow of the development of Western civilization. And there are people who argue that it's part of the same development that ultimately led to the collapse of, um, of uh, the old regimes, of, of feudal structures, of government mm. by the nobility, and the development of uh, Western democracies. Uh, I think that there's no doubt that they are interrelated. Uh, the, uh, the development of the, 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 the rich place of the Bible in Western art and literature uh, is a consequence of this. There's no doubt about it. I think there were some negative consequences as well. Um, Protestants tended to forget that the Reformers were talking about if the Bible was in people's language, it, it nonetheless was a community of people and they tended to think of individual persons and uh, Protestantism tended to hive off into all that, into this, you know, enormous multitude of sects, mm. with everybody being uh, his own pope. 
Uh, and everybody interpreting the Bible for, for themselves. themselves and starting their own little religious community. And that kind of individualism, I think, was one of the negative consequences. Uh, I think, on the other hand, in our century, uh, we're beginning to see a reversal of that trend and a, and a growing together of Christians, which is healthy. And, and it's also encouraging that that's happening uh, in and around the Bible. What uh, led to, in some Protestant denominations, um, say in the 19th, uh, early 20th century, what led to sort of a, a growing away from the Bible, um, going to, uh, to modernism in a sense, or liberalism? What, what uh, led to that? Well, that was really a consequence of, of the, uh, well, it was part of the liberalism of the 18th and 19th centuries, but that in turn was a reaction against the excessive Bible literalism that Protestantism and, and, and radical individualism that Protestantism had fallen into in the 16th and 17th centuries. Mm -hmm. So that with the movement we call the Enlightenment and the development of liberalism, uh, people tended to then make f uh, mock the Bible, uh, say, well, I mean, you can't believe all those stories about uh, Jesus walking on water, the world being made in six days, and so on. And uh, that's, let's leave the Bible behind. That's part of the, of the legends of an ancient past. That's mythology and so on. Let's just leave that. So uh, Christianity, some forms of it anyway, moved away from the Bible uh, and uh, you had really a, a sharp distinction between Christians who were on the one hand all fundamentalist in mm -hmm. their attachment to the liter literal sense of the Bible and on the other Christians who had almost abandoned the Bible altogether except as kind of, you know, nostalgic literature once in a while. But now there's a kind of coming back to that. I think so, yes. Both fundamentalism, both the right wing of Christianity and, and the, and the uh, liberalism on the other extreme, uh, I think are finding themselves growing together uh, even as the Catholics are moving toward, towards an area where all Christians are meeting more and more in a common uh, study of the Bible. Um, what kinds of uh, gains do you hope to make in the exposition in terms of uh, making this available to the public. What, one of the things about the exposition that you're doing that strikes me is similar to what translating the Bible does. It makes knowledge accessible to the public and it's opening the doors of the School of Theology to the public and, and making that knowledge available. Is that part of the thinking of the school as well? Yes, I would like to think so. We're, we're encouraging through our lay education program, we're encouraging people to come uh, to and, and, and take the opportunity to use this as a, as a way of doing some reflection for themselves on the meaning of the place of the Bible in their own history, their own experience. And we hope that that will, will stimulate that kind of uh, individual response. I'm sure it will. It sounds very exciting and I hope to get out there soon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Gerald, for being with us. We've been talking about 450 years of the Bible in the people's language and our guest has been Gerald Hobbs, Professor of Church History at the Vancouver School of Theology. This has been Pressure Point for this week. Good night.